Take heed, keep on the alert, for you do not know when the appointed time will come. It is like a man away on a journey, who upon leaving his house and putting his slaves in charge, assigning to each one his task, also commanded the doorkeeper to stay on the alert. Therefore be on the alert, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, whether in the evening, at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, in case he should come suddenly and find you asleep. What I say to you, I say to all, be on the alert. Mark 13, 34-37 Vincent's note on this portion of scripture is very helpful. Quote, The apostles are thus compared with the doorkeepers, and the night season is in keeping with the figure. In the temple, during the night, the captain of the temple made his rounds, and the guards had to rise at his approach and salute him in a particular manner. Any guard found asleep on duty was beaten, or his garment set on fire. Compare Revelation 16 verse 15, Blessed is he that watches and keeps his garments. The preparations for the morning service required all to be early astir. The superintending priest might knock at the door at any moment. The rabbis use almost the very words in which scripture describes the unexpected coming of the master. Sometimes he comes at the cock crowing, sometimes a little earlier, sometimes a little later. He came and knocked and they opened to him. The words when the time is of verse 33 are defined in their context as the time of the return of the master, namely the second advent of the Messiah to Israel. Be on the alert means to be watchful or to refrain from physical sleep. Later, it came to be used in the moral and religious sphere and was used to call for one to be on the alert in a constant state of readiness and vigilant. We are to be watchful and ready to respond to external influences, focused, alert for the winds of temptation or overt attacks of evil. We are to remain alert lest we be deceived by the devil, the deceiver, or sin which is deceitful. You do not know when the master of the house is coming. This uncertainty should motivate diligence in maintaining an alert state. The word master is curios, which suggests that Jesus is applying the picture of the absent landlord to himself. Whether in the evening, 6 to 9 p.m., at midnight, 9 p.m. till midnight, or when the rooster crows, midnight till 3 a.m., in the morning, 3 to 6 a.m., this was a common way to describe the four watches of the night, the Roman system of time. The point is that he could return on any of these watches, in case he should come suddenly and find you asleep. He is Jesus. You is the disciples. The time of his return is unknown, so that it will occur without warning. The idea of asleep would refer especially in the spiritual sense. What I say to you, I say to all, be on the alert. Jesus repeats the command, be on the alert, and he is calling for this to be our lifestyle. Notice the word all signaling that this command is for every disciple of every age. Luke 21, 34 through 36 is a good parallel to this passage. Quote, be on guard so that your hearts will not be weighed down in drunkenness and the worries of life and that day not come on you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon all those who dwell on the face of the earth. But keep on the alert at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Warren Worsby comments, The parable of the householder warns all of us today to be alert, because we do not know when he will return to take us to heaven. Like the householder in the story, before our Lord went from us back to heaven, 
He gave each of us work to do. He expects us to be faithful while he is gone and to be working when he returns. Take heed, watch, and pray is his admonition. John MacArthur sums up Mark 13 like this. So in response to the disciples' question about the end of the age, the Lord Jesus explained that he would return after a long period of world history, which will culminate in a final catastrophic period of global tribulation. Jesus carefully forewarned the future generation that will witness those final events, including the rise of the Antichrist and his desecration of the temple, that the end is near. Though the events predicted in the Olivet Discourse are still future, its truth serves to instruct every generation of believers throughout church history. On the one hand, it serves as a vivid reminder that the things of this world are temporary and that the redeemed are citizens of an eternal kingdom that is yet to be revealed on earth when the Lord comes in glory. On the other hand, it provides a compelling motivation for believers to proclaim the glorious gospel of Christ to those who are perishing so that they might be saved from the impending judgment of God. In a parallel passage on this subject, I want to play this soundbite from MacArthur concerning Matthew 24, 15 through 30 on the parable of the talents. The imagery is clear. The master represents Christ and his prolonged absence pictures the time between Christ's ascension and his second coming. The slaves are professing believers who have been entrusted as stewards with various resources, abilities, blessings, and opportunities. One day, they will all be called to give an account for that stewardship. That the first two slaves represent true believers becomes quickly apparent in the parable. Though they receive different amounts of money to manage, each in accordance with his ability, they both invested wisely, worked diligently, and demonstrated their faithfulness to the master. Similarly, believers have each been entrusted with different abilities and opportunities. We're called to be faithful with what we have been given, knowing that each will receive his own reward according to his own labor, as 1 Corinthians 3.8 puts it. To hear our master say, well done, and welcome us into heaven is the greatest reward we could ever receive. As faithful slaves in this life, we will be given even greater opportunities to serve in heaven. Such is implied by Jesus' parallel parable in Luke 19, 11 to 27, where the king grants governing authority over parts of his kingdom as a reward to his dutiful slaves. Likewise, we look forward to reigning with Christ as part of our heavenly reward. Now, the third slave represented a person who claims to be a Christian, but in reality serves only himself. Luke 19.27 says, But these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. But for the believer... Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Maranatha. <laughs> 